Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. Complete and utter domination was the order of the day as Pep Guardiola's men cruised to a 4 0 win against Carlo Ancelotti's Real Madrid. This game was all Man City from start to finish, but what tactics did we see from Ancelotti and why were Pep's City so dominant? Let's take a look, and we'll begin with City on the ball as they dominated on it, especially in the first half. Initially, in the City build-up, we saw a lot of similarities with the first leg, with Stones pushing up from the midfield, and a back three consisting of Akanji, Walker and Diaz, allowing De Bruyne and Gundogan to push higher up into the half spaces, whilst Benzema would head up the press, with Modric pushing higher and between the two pivots so that he could look to cover either side. But to prevent him being overloaded 2 versus 1, Vinicius and Rodrigo would operate extremely narrow, allowing Valverde and Toni Kroos deeper to pick up the men in the half spaces. So the goal here would be making central progression as difficult for City as possible. In these scenarios, at times, City could get a pivot on the ball. However, if Real were set in their defensive shape, the City pivot wouldn't have time to turn, so often they would be forced backward. So overall, this would mean that the wide centre-backs in Walker and Akanji were seeing a lot of the ball, and they are two of the less competent on-the-ball players for City, so Real would have been happy with this. Here we see that Stones and Rodri double pivot, Akanji, Diaz and Walker being a dedicated back three, but Madrid's narrow three makes play through the centre much more difficult. So when the wider centre-backs were able to get onto the ball, if Real were set in this shape, it would be fairly easy for the winger to move out and apply pressure. Though the winger could be the outlet, in scenarios like this, Kamavinga or Carvajal on the far side would be able to be much more aggressive on their winger and prevent them turning for the most part. We could see the winger staying higher, pushing the fullback deep, and De Bruyne dropping into this area. However, if Real's defensive shape was set, it would mean the midfielder would have the scope to push out and press De Bruyne and prevent him making progress. Although we did see at times De Bruyne picking up the ball in these regions that are fairly natural to him. What we would also see in these scenarios where Real Madrid were set in their defensive shape is that even when De Bruyne and Gundogan pushed up into these half spaces, because this higher three were covering the City double pivot, Real were much more capable of dealing with the men in the half spaces. With Valverde at times dropping in, allowing the back four to shift into a five, mean that even when the winger did receive, it was a 1v1 and these runs could be tracked much more efficiently. So essentially, it was highly important for Madrid to prevent the ball into the double pivot, because if the pivots were able to turn, that would change the game completely. This is because if they could get their heads up, with men attacking the half spaces, there was the possibility for Haaland to drop into these regions in the midfield. Or even if that wasn't the case, it opened up the possibility for 2v1s in small spaces. So for example, suppose Rodri got on the ball in this region and had time to get his head up. When Modric pressed, it would leave Stones in a little bit of space in this region. So on more than one occasion, we saw him receive the ball in a situation like this and then drive into the heart of the midfield. Alternatively, if, rather than Modric for example, being drawn onto the man, it was a winger in Vinicius, this would still facilitate the 2 versus one as Walker from deep could now receive in this slightly wider position. The Real press is much less efficient here, so Rodri can receive and get his head up. So he can drive forward and this draws Modric towards the ball, but Stones is making the move in behind him. So Modric was drawn and then Stones can push higher up. So Madrid were narrow, Stones can find Walker in this case. That draws Vinicius wider, so now Modric is more isolated in what looks to be a 1v1. But Stones plays it into Rodri, who draws Modric and creates space for Stones to then receive the return. And he has acres of space to drive into, and as we can see, Kroos and Valverde were looking to cover men in the half spaces. These scenarios where the pivots were able to get into more controlled positions opened up possibilities for City. Firstly, now, when the men were in the half space, it was harder to track them, because a deeper pivot would potentially have to close down a man who was driving forward. It would also mean that Valverde, for example, couldn't afford to drop deep early in order to create that back five, as this would leave them too underloaded in the midfield. So City now more often had the five versus four against the Real backline, meaning that the likes of Kamavinga would have to start narrow. 
and once the ball then came out wide, we saw how effective both Jack Grealish and Bernardo Silva were in their 1 vs 1 situations against their fullbacks, tormenting them throughout the 90, especially supported by the men in the half spaces, where if the fullback got too tight, they were consistently making runs to receive in these regions, only sometimes being tracked by the midfielder. The right hand side was perhaps where City were most ruthless with this. When Bernardo got onto the ball, he was not only supported by underlapping runs by De Bruyne, but he would at times look to overlap him as well, being able to receive in crossing positions, or if Camavinga stood off, Bernardo could then drive in on his strong foot. But it didn't end there, as time and again Walker made these expansive runs from right centre back at the exact right opportunity to then receive at pace, again looking to cross or rotate possession. City's midfielders have more control possession, so the pass into Bernardo is on. That is immediately the trigger for Walker to make the overlapping run. And he doesn't get onto the ball, but it opens up the opportunity for Bernardo to drive in on his strong foot. But from early on in this match, Pep made a slight tactical tweak that may have made all of the difference, as it forced Real Madrid to adapt their defensive shape. Rather than sticking to this back three buildup with the three centre backs, as soon as City felt somewhat comfortable in possession, they instead switched to a back two, consisting of Diaz plus one, so it could be Walker or Akanji. So, for example, if Diaz was in that position, it would be Diaz and Walker, and Akanji would push up. But unlike other times where we've seen City use the two three shape, where the midfield three would be spread fairly evenly across the pitch like this. Instead, the double pivot remained in their position with only the centre back moving wider. This would cause issues as now the winger would be dragged wider much earlier, meaning that Modric was under that two versus one pressure much more often. These situations on the other side weren't helped by the fact that as the game went on, rather than dropping into the two three shape with the rest of the midfield, or even more of a midfield 5 when Real were under more consistent pressure, Vinicius began to stay higher up the pitch as more of a transitional threat, especially as Walker was now higher up the pitch presenting these opportunities. This would leave Real Madrid overloaded down the flanks and also vulnerable through the centre, so they adapted their shape, instead now opting for more of a midfield diamond that could look like this with Rodrigo being drawn infield. Again, the priority being protecting the centre of the pitch and forcing the ball wide. So here we see that much narrower midfield shape from Real Madrid with Rodrigo being at the tip. The downside of this, of course, would be the space out wide. However, when the ball did go wide and City were looking to overload the flanks, it would mean that Real's whole midfield would be forced across the pitch. This did have disadvantages though, as what we would often see is the likes of Rodri or Akanji picking up the ball in these regions, and this would force Carvajal Naru to defend the man in the half space, and as a result we saw Grealish time and again receiving the ball wide with the space to run at Carvajal, leading to Grealish causing havoc throughout the 90, and Real Madrid just couldn't cope. But I also briefly want to touch on City's pressing shape. From goal kicks, they would drop Militao and Alaba into the box to begin with, and City did not want to be outnumbered in the midfield regions. So where Haaland would look to press, rather than being joined by De Bruyne and leaving a 3 versus 2 in central regions like we usually see, it was Grealish from out wide who would join in, and Tony Kroos, the deepest man, would be covered by De Bruyne, and if a second pivot dropped al alongside him, Gundogan or Rodri would look to support. This would still leave a potential 1 versus 1 in deeper regions. However, Real would be able to play out at times by initially drawing Grealish towards the ball before playing it to a pivot, and Akanji was aggressive in covering the fullback. In these situations, though it was somewhat risky for City, Real Madrid also had some success long in these scenarios, especially when Akanji was looking to push on to Carvajal. What we saw in these situations was Benzema dropping into the midfield and Vinicius and Rodrigo both playing much more centrally. So this could mean a 2 versus one against Rodri, allowing Real to initially receive the ball. Alternatively, if a centre-back was drawn higher, Real were more than happy to go long and look for the pace of Vinicius and Rodrigo running in behind and they got into dangerous situations but could never really make it count. The citizens have enacted their revenge and progressed to their second ever final, coming in as heavy favourites versus Inter. 
But what went wrong for Madrid in this match? And what are your early predictions for the final? Drop it down in the comments below. For the manager tactical scores, this was not close, with Pep's side dominating in this semi-final, going almost perfect, with Pep earning a 9. Ancelotti, on the other hand... Ugh. Don't make me do this. Ancelotti earns a 2. But what are your thoughts? Drop it down below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, you might enjoy the content available on my Patreon. Not only does Patreon help to support the continued production of content, as I am a one-man team, but it also gives you early access to videos that will come on the channel. You'll also get exclusive videos, get to vote on polls, and so much more, and it's cheaper than ever, no longer having a tier system, so everyone on the Patreon gets access to all the content. So head over to patreon.com slash simple to check it out. But that's all for today and remember, keep it simple.